the low rolling hills and grassy flatlands of the Midwest prairie offer more than just a glimpse of wildflowers and fields. Nestled in quaint small towns are legendary back roads, cemeteries, and crumbling buildings, many of which hold extraordinary accounts of the paranormal. Tales of vengeful apparitions, wandering spirits, unseen forces, and eerie occurrences have been shared for decades. What happens when these tales go untold? Do they fade into obscurity with the passing of time? Extraordinary stories, creepy legends, and folklore are meant to live, not die on the side of the road or be buried in a graveyard. These aren't your ordinary paranormal stories about places and events that have been told countless times around the bonfire. These are the stories that might just get lost in time if it weren't for the people that are brave enough to share them. These are the stories of the Paranormal Prairie. classic creepy graveyard. We all know of a place or two that can send chills down the spine just thinking about it. Cemeteries are chosen as a bridge between the land of the living and the spiritual world. In culture, graveyards tend to have a legacy of fear, most of which is unfounded. However, some believe that it's not the dead that cause the hauntings, but rather the actions of the living. While many would argue that cemetery lore can be attributed to the weakness of the human psyche, some legends hold more than a grain of truth. As immigrants began to come over from Europe, they followed the burial practices of the Europeans, which was essentially churchyards. Uh, which quickly became overcrowded and smelly and, and, and overgrown. Uh, but as the population moved west, the pioneers didn't have that available to them. They would often just bury their dead where they fell, or as they began to settle, they would pick plots of land on their property to bury their family members out behind the house, essentially. Uh, those eventually grew into these little cemeteries you see all over central Illinois now, uh, just family plots with 20, 30 graves in them. A lot of those are now being swallowed up by farmland and, and forest, but there were tons of them in the past. Uh, that tradition continued on until uh, cities began to develop. They picked city cemeteries usually, uh, places for, their, for the city's dead, which were quickly surrounded by the city, which became a health problem. 
and they moved them out to the outside, outskirts of town uh, in the tradition of the garden cemeteries from Europe. So like Oak Ridge Cemetery in Springfield or Greenwood Cemetery in Decatur are examples of that. Uh, those are the cemeteries we're familiar with now. Uh, but when you look around the countryside, you look out into the fields, you see those copes of trees. Those are a lot of times little burial grounds. Now these small rural cemeteries often attract, uh, let's, let's call them unsavory types, who, who go out into the woods and, and are thrill seekers. Uh, they ignore the fact that these are the resting places of Revolutionary War veterans and, and Civil War veterans. They're there for the, the thrill of being in the cemetery at night. And what's sad about that is it often leads to desecration, uh, destruction of the, of the stones, vandalism of all sorts, uh, which has left a lot of these in sad states of disrepair, which often is said to lead to hauntings. Over the course of time, a lot of these cemeteries develop reputations as haunted places, and some are and some aren't. But if you travel around central Illinois, you can find dozens of cemeteries with ghost stories associated with them. Greenwood Cemetery in Decatur is arguably one of the most haunted cemeteries in Illinois. Ask any local about Greenwood Cemetery, Decatur, and they will most likely be able to recite a few of the alleged tales that make it known as the most haunted graveyard in all of central Illinois. Dancing lights, a ghostly bride searching for her betrothed, strange creatures lurking in the woods, Native American burials, grave robbers, and Civil War spirits are all said to inhabit these sacred grounds, which were once known as Hell's Hollow. Winterbauer is both a skeptic and believer in the legends of Greenwood and has his own theories about what causes the hauntings. Now Greenwood dates back, it was formally founded in the 1850s, but there's evidence that burials were here long before that, including Native American burials. The whole place is carved out of an area that used to be known as Hell's Hollow. It was a huge, expansive wilderness. Uh, and the Indians used it as burial grounds. The Sangamon River to our south was their main artery of traffic through here. So it was an active place. And as I've touched on in other things, the, the Native Americans knew places of power. So this place is built on a place the natives thought was powerful, which adds immediately to the atmosphere of the place. The history on top of that just piles on. I don't believe cemeteries are haunted because they're cemeteries. I believe they're haunted because of things that happen on the grounds. Greenwood's had a murder. It's had a couple of suicides. There's evidence of unmarked graves all over the cemetery. There's been grave desecration. One of the caretakers was stealing from corpses before he put them in the ground. All of that has created an atmosphere that ebbs and flows Sometimes it's very, very peaceful, and sometimes it's very heavy and ominous. Tragedy and untimely death is often thought to be a contributing factor to hauntings, and the story of the Greenwood Bride has both. This tale has its roots in the 1930s, where two young lovers, one a bootlegger, were apparently never meant to be together in life and perhaps are still a part in death. Now, if you look at cemeteries across the country, you will find cemetery brides just like this story. This one has a basis. In fact, the legend has it that a, a woman buried in her wedding dress walks the hills. Where these stories start, not really sure, but there is a tradition going way back where they would bury people in their burial shrouds and people walking past the cemetery started to see people in shrouds or dresses wandering through the cemeteries. Maybe that's how some of this starts. In our case, the girl was uh, in love with a bootlegger during the Prohibition era. He was murdered. She, in her grief, committed suicide. Her parents buried her up here on this hill in her wedding dress. 
And ever since that time, people have seen this girl's misty figure walking through the cemetery. There are a surprisingly large number of Confederate soldiers buried in Illinois, and many were laid to rest in unmarked graves. The brutality of the Civil War led to the mistreatment of prisoners and may be behind the most haunted area in Greenwood. So we're standing in what is the most notoriously haunted place in Greenwood Cemetery, the Civil War section, haunted not by the gentlemen buried here now, but the ones that used to be buried here, Confederate soldiers. And how did Confederates come to be buried in a graveyard in central Illinois? Goes back to the Civil War. Right over behind us are the uh, train tracks that led up to Chicago from the Deep South. They would take prisoners of war from, from the Deep South up to Camp Douglas in Chicago. Along the way, those prisoners sometimes died, and they were buried in the most convenient cemetery they could find. Here was Decatur, was Greenwood. And the story says a, a trainload of guys with yellow fever was heading north. One of the symptoms of yellow fever is you've lapsed into a coma, and for all intents and purposes, appear to be dead. That happened here. They, the government offloaded those gentlemen and buried them on a hillside, a rocky hillside that would never be used under, under any other circumstances here, and moved on. There are soldiers' diaries that say they believe they buried those men alive because they were in a coma. If that's the case, unrest right there. But it gets worse for those guys because they were buried here along the side of this hill. And in the 1920s, a flood washed the, the back part of the cemetery out, including a big chunk of, of this hill um, where those graves were. They washed them down into the valley. They were collected up. They were buried in mass graves. And they remain there today in unmarked graves. Unmarked graves, grave disruption, all of that leads to hauntings. And this hillside is said to be haunted by the soldiers of that era. Uh, the stories are numerous. Uh, one gentleman told us his daughter just recently saw a soldier with one leg. Uh, another very famous story is a young boy riding his bike through the cemetery, looks up here to the hillside, sees what he believes to be a homeless man gesturing for him to come up the hill. The kid does. And as he approaches this man, he looks at him and the man says, help me, I don't know where I'm at, I just want to go home. And he faded away. It took us 30 years to get that kid to come back to the cemetery. Uh, it, it freaked him out. To skeptics, there is no merit to the stories of specters and entities that wander the graves of Greenwood. But those who have witnessed the unexplained phenomenon all agree that the moniker of Hell's Hollow is justified and hollowed grounds are to be respected, not only for the dead, but for those who are beyond the living. However, those who wish to anoint Greenwood the most haunted cemetery in Illinois may want to rethink that. Not far away lies a window area to the paranormal, known for apparitions, hooded figures, cryptids, and UFO sightings putting it into the category of high strangeness. The, the legends and the history of the hill as far as the paranormal aspect of it, um, it's a little bit of everything out here. Uh, it's a veritable paranormal stew of activity. It's, uh, there's, there's several places around the United States they call paranormal hotspots, and I would say this is one of them. Uh, everything from ghostly activity takes place out here to strange lights in the woods, strange lights in the sky. Uh, I've talked to people who have seen ghoulish looking figures uh, in the woods. Uh, there's a, a, an old man that is seen wandering the road leading to the cemetery. Uh, a woman in black has been seen several times in the graveyard itself. Uh, screams, muffled screams. I've heard muffled screams that sounded like they were coming from the ground. I've talked to locals out here who've also heard the screaming uh, uh, in the woods at night. Um, so a little bit of everything takes place out here. Williamsburg Hill itself is, uh, is located in South Central Illinois, uh, just a little bit uh, from the small town of Tower Hill. Uh, it, um, it's basically the hill itself is uh, unusual because it's uh, 800, over 800 feet high, which makes it the highest point in this part of Illinois. Um, the hill itself is surrounded by woods. Uh, there's a few scattered uh, folks still living out here on the hill. Um, but uh, it's, it's a mound, like I said, of limestone. There's uh, crevices, 
uh, berms, I guess you would call them. Um, you know, there's just a lot of, uh, it's, it's kind of a, the woods surrounding it is, it's kind of a, a you know, rough uh, terrain. One of the strangest stories uh, told to me when I was out here was, uh, I met a lady from Pena, her name was Kathy. And she told me that she'd been coming out here for 30 plus years. And the reason she came out here was she knew the stories about the cemetery and they would come out here, sometimes even bring a, a picnic lunch and would spend uh, a morning or afternoon out here seeing if anything you know, weird would happen. Well, this one particular morning, Kathy and her daughter and her granddaughter came out here. The granddaughter was six years old at the time. This happened in 2007. Uh, they were out here looking around. They'd only been out here a short time. The granddaughter took off to the southeast corner, again, the strangest corner of the cemetery. She took off to the southeast corner of the cemetery and only been playing for a few minutes. And Kathy and her daughter were looking around at some of the older stones. And all of a sudden, the granddaughter comes running back, you know, yelling, Grandma, Grandma. And they said, uh, Kathy told me that uh, the granddaughter just had this real terrified look on her face. And they asked her what's wrong. And she says, Grandma, Grandma, the old woman over there, she asked me if I wanted to play with the children. And uh, Kathy said, the granddaughter looked at me and she said, with this puzzled look on her face, she said, when I asked the woman where they were at, she told me they were under the ground. And Kathy said that's when the granddaughter took off. She didn't even look back to see where the woman went. Um, she's, Kathy said, we then, after the granddaughter told us this, we went over to confront the, confront the lady. And we went over there, we didn't see anybody. And I asked the granddaughter to describe her and she said, well, it was an older woman. She had her hair in a bun, was wearing a long black dress. And again, the, the, the granddaughter repeated, she asked if I wanted to play with the children. But when I asked her, she said they were under the ground. Kathy said, we looked all around, we didn't see her. Um, Kathy said the way she was dressed, there was no way she could have made it through the woods. There were no other cars here. The only way out of the cemetery, she would have had to pass them, but they, there was no, they didn't see her, you know, come past them. Um, so they had no idea where she went. And another gentleman told me basically the same story when he was out here. He saw the old woman and uh, no other cars were here, you know, and uh, next thing you know, she's gone. Hearing about people's experiences can be intriguing, but having an encounter of one's own can change beliefs. The first time I filmed out here at night, uh, I was by myself and it was around 10.30 at night. Um, there's a, uh, the ridge at the top of the hill here, there's a large oak tree, and I had set up my camera filming uh, using infrared. Uh, just wanted to get some shots of the cemetery uh, for a, a documentary I was gonna do. And uh, I had filmed up there for about 30 minutes, and I was gonna move down by the gate to see if I could get a, uh, read some recorded shots of possibly the old man that people see on the road. And I picked up my camera and tripod, and I'd only walked about 20 yards when all of a sudden to my right from the woods, uh, which was probably about you know 40 to 50 yards from me, there was a loud shrill whistle. And it was like the type of whistle that uh, a person makes when they take their two fingers, they'll put them under their tongue and they do that come here type whistle. Um, so it, it startled me because it sounded like a person. Uh, all the birds, uh, when I got her out here, had you know long since uh, roosted for the night, so I knew it wasn't a bird or didn't think it was a bird. So I continued to walk. I got about 20 yards farther down the hill, and it happened again. Only this time, it had moved with me, had gone an estimated 20 yards with me, and it did it again, the loud, shrill, come here type whistle. And the weird thing about it is, I knew that if it was a person, there's no way they could walk through the woods without me hearing them. Plus, they would have to have some type of light in order to see their way around in the woods. I've, I've been out in the woods in the daytime, and it's treacherous trying to walk through there in the daytime, let alone trying to do it at night without a light. Even if they had night vision goggles, I still should have heard them. So I continued my walk toward the gate, and I got about another 20 yards, and it happened again. And this time, it had moved with me uh, like it was moving down the hill with me. So I continued to the road, or to the uh, parking lot, and I set up my camera and tripod about uh, 10 feet from the woods uh, on my right hand side still. And as I was setting up my tripod or my camera, the whistling happened just to my right. And I'm talking 10 feet or less away from me in the woods. So whatever it was, even though I had a straight shot from the oak tree to the cemetery gate, whatever this was made it a, a, in a roundabout way, made it through the woods without me hearing them, without me seeing any light or anything, and beat me to the spot I was going. It was, it was impossible. There had to be either multiple people or, or whatever it was, or 
it was supernatural. I mean, I, I can't explain it any other way. Is Will Hill a portal, a window area of high strangeness? If you are a believer, there is no doubt that the hill is more than just a bump in the road when it comes to the supernatural. River towns often have an abundance of anomalous tales, and especially those that lie on a border, seemingly stuck eternally between two locations. With the confluence of three rivers traveling across a bed of limestone, Alton has the perfect storm of energy, a giant battery for the strange and unusual. Situated just outside of St. Louis, this Illinois town embraces the hauntings that are said to thrive among the community. The Mineral Springs Hotel is said to channel that energy more than any other location in Alton, verified by American Hauntings founder, Troy Taylor. The building that we're sitting in is the old Mineral Springs Hotel. Uh, it hasn't been a hotel since 1965, but that's still the way that everyone refers to it because it is such a landmark in the city, or at least it was when it was built back in 1914. It was considered to be probably the, the nicest, most luxurious hotel anywhere in the region at the time. And it was built for the single purpose of serving as a spa for people who had illnesses or ailments, arthritis, rheumatism, that kind of thing. So they could come here and get some relief from it. Um, medicine wasn't what it is today. So people would go to places like this where they could soak in the waters. And the history behind this place, the years and the hundreds of thousands of people that have been through this building over the years has left really an impression behind on the building. There are a number of stories, there are a number of events and incidents that have taken place that are still being repeated inside this building, which has made it, I think, the most haunted location in Alton and one of the most haunted locations in America because of the number of firsthand accounts, the number of reported sightings and the things that have taken place here. The hauntings here in the hotel have many, many stories. There are stories of a woman with incredibly flowery perfume that appears on the staircase um, just to the side of us. There is also um, several folks that say that they've had experiences down in the pool. I would say the pool is probably one of our most active areas in the hotel. It's also the most common spot where people say they have experiences. So when we bring groups in, and we turn off the lights. There comes a point in the evening where the tour guide will turn off the lights for you. And it's usually at that point that people say they have the, wor the weirdest of experiences. Um, I think the most common one that I hear is that there are typically people standing in the group that are there when the lights turn on. And when the lights turn off and back on again, those people are gone. With the multitude of guests that the former Grand Hotel has seen, it is no wonder that stories exist of spirits wandering the corridors. Taylor's research has debunked some of the claims of hauntings, but there is one location that he insists holds true to its reputation. I've spent a lot of time in this building over the years um, between doing ghost tours and just being in the building alone or with a couple of other people. Um, even from very early on, stories began to circulate as they were reopening this place that, you know, sometimes they would hear footsteps, they would hear sounds. Um, that's something I've commonly experienced here. I, I've experienced water that appears in the middle of a hallway for absolutely no reason. There are no pipes, there are no leaks. It just appears, it's just there. Probably the most um, eerie or at least unnerving experience I had here was in the old swimming pool where people used to come and take in the waters. Um, years ago, I had a chance to be in the hotel overnight and I wanted to experience that swimming pool uh, that everybody said was so haunted for myself and was sitting in that swimming pool, it was quiet, had been sitting down there for an hour when the door to the room opened up, footsteps walked inside the room. They could clearly hear them in the silence. 
called out, there was no one to answer, turned on a light, there was no one standing there, but the door was wide open. Uh, I, we searched the hotel, there was no one in the place but us. And that was, that was an experience that uh, I didn't, at least didn't care to repeat that night. <laughs> I left. I would say that I've had some experiences. They're not outward experiences, I think is probably the best way that I would put it. You, you always hear things creaking and cracking, so you always kind of wonder in the back of your mind if that's something going on. I've seen some strange things down in the pool. Nothing like overtly strange, though. Um, so for me personally, this place is still kind of a mecca. I'm still waiting for it to open up to me. Um, but every time I come in, I can tell you, I still feel the vibe of this place. It's got a really cool vibe, but a little bit creepy as well. There have been all kinds of different things encountered by people in this building. Um, they will hear footsteps, they will hear sounds, they'll hear voices, whispers, tapping sounds, what seems to be hard-soled shoes when there's no one there, uh, smells. Uh, oftentimes it won't necessarily be what you might expect it to be, the old spring water, it'll be perfumes or colognes or even uh, cigar smoke sometimes. These things just come from nowhere. There's no explanation for them. You know, people have seen shadows, they have seen full-bodied apparitions they believe are a living person until they go around a corner and there's no one there anymore. So these things happen on a regular basis here. And it is not uncommon for just someone visiting this place at random to have these kinds of experiences. Over the years, the Mineral Springs has become one of the most popular places on the American Hauntings tours. Just as it once attracted the afflicted from around the world, it now attracts the curious. Visitors are drawn for a variety of reasons, but it all stems from one desire, to catch a glimpse of the afterlife, to prove once and for all that there is more to experience beyond inevitable death. In all honesty, we get thousands and thousands of people who come on the tours, they come to our events because they want to come to Alton, because Alton has this reputation for being one of the most haunted small towns in America. So I get asked a lot why people, why do they want to come to this stuff? Why do they want to be scared? Why in the world would you want to go to a place that you know is supposed to be haunted and subject yourself to it? Um, I think there's so many answers to that question. I don't think I could list them all. Uh, but I think people enjoy being unnerved, for one thing. They like to be scared. They like the sensation that's out of the ordinary, that's not everyday life. This is something that appeals to people. Um, I also think there are a lot of people who go into this stuff, they look at the, the haunted places and the ghost stories and things, and they see it as something, rather than scary, they see it as something hopeful. Uh, they see it as, you know, if I come to this place and I have an experience and I truly believe that's a ghost, that means there's something else after this. That, that convinces me that there's more than just, you know, I'm going to live here for a while and then I'm going to die and that's the end. Um, if they can come to a place like this and have an experience, you know, that for a lot of people that will cement the idea that there's more. I think everybody has their own impression of this place. I think some people find it creepy because they come in and they're hoping for the stories, they're hoping for the paranormal, they're hoping for all of those things so they think it's creepy. And then I think there are some people that find it like a beautiful place, like some of our friends that run the metaphysical shop up at the front, they bring so many people in to experience the building and they find it a place of calm. In all the years I've been involved with doing things here at the Mineral Springs, I've had a lot of people who come up to me and tell me that they don't believe the stories, that they think that they're all made up and that it's all just fiction. So my challenge to them is always, well, why don't you come here sometime and spend the night? Because I've had a lot of people who've told me I don't believe in ghosts, but the Mineral Springs has made me a believer. Perhaps the most intimidating types of hauntings are those which can be found right off the beaten path. When the road itself is a window area, 
the safety found on the inside of a car no longer exists. People love roadside haunted places, mostly because of the atmosphere. The rural, secluded areas where help is nowhere to be found should you need it. You're all on your own. It's much darker than it is in the city. And all that plays with your mind conjuring up images of these places being cursed with legends and folklore. Most of the origins of these legends are very difficult to find. Oftentimes they go back many decades. But what we're finding is that a lot of them are tied to an actual event. And over the years, these legends, they morph, they progress. They're never stagnant. Every generation puts their new twist on these legends. Most of the time they are based on a factual event but other times they just seem to accumulate over the years and grow and expand. The strangeness of being inside of a cemetery is well documented, but what happens when boundaries between hollowed ground and the living are blurred? What happens when the living are pulled to the land of the dead, like a beacon in the night that is meant to mislead travelers? So the turning angel of Calvary Cemetery the main legend tells of a man getting this angel placed over the grave of his beloved wife who passed away. And that unsuspecting people walking out there often see it moving on its own as though it's alive. Other people who are out there paying their respects to their loved ones often hear a crying or moaning coming from the angel, but when they look over, nobody can be found. So these roadside haunts tend to be a, a gathering place for young people, that they go out there and meet other people in these locations. Again, as more social areas are disbanding, that these roadside haunts really become something that just is done. I can't tell you how many people contact me saying, this was just something every new high school class did every generation. It was known, and it's something the entire community can share in. Uh, when I was in high school, uh, a group of my friends wanted to come out and check out the statue. It was kind of like a, a thrill-seeking thing. We always heard stories about it, but wanted to get scared. So. Uh, we drove out here. Um, the legend that we heard of it was basically that it was this angel statue. We were told that it could rotate, that it used to face the road. And I remember it facing the road when we went, but now it's not. So that's kind of weird. But um, And then we also were told like uh, that it cries and the eyes glow red. The trend among common haunts is the embellishment of the events as if the truth isn't frightening enough that certainly doesn't diminish the psychological effects of visiting these locations. The story seems to be completely embellished, that it was put as a memorial for a family, not a loving husband for his wife. And sometimes these legends, the origin's not quite right. It's a little bit off. Fact is sorted from fiction, but often the uh, phenomena remains the same that regardless of why this statue was placed there, it's now moving on its own and seemingly coming to life. I have been part of the paranormal field for many years, so it's interesting to um, see if other people's experiences hold true with those of my own when I stop at these places. The thrill of it just in general is that seeing anything paranormal anywhere is awesome because so many people don't believe in it. Um, and not everyone gets the pleasure of experiencing something like that. But I also like roadside haunts just because it's something local. You know, there's a lot of things that are close to where you live. So that makes it more convenient too. I do think it's very important to keep these stories alive um, in a respectful way, of course, but also just because 
even if you don't have the experiences that are told with these legends, you know, real people were involved with them. You know, yes, the angel statue is just a statue, but it's a statue for a man's wife who passed. So um, I do think it's important to kind of carry that on. And they were real people, too, and their legacy gets to live on through, you know, people seeking out the different um, paranormal things that happen. The wickedness of man is undoubtedly the most terrifying of all, especially when those actions create a supernatural phenomenon. A series of unnerving events in Collinsville, Illinois, may be responsible for opening a portal to the dark abyss. Only the brave or foolish dare to take this journey through the seven gates of hell. We're at the seventh gate of hell in Collinsville, Illinois. The routes we took, it was kind of a very narrow area. Um, a lot of scenic, a lot of graffiti on the bridges, a lot of narrow roadways. Uh, there's a lot of cemeteries in the area. Uh, you gotta pay attention because you can't get run over out here. <laughs> Paranormal researchers are drawn to this dare to witness a variety of activity, which includes ghostly apparitions, residual hauntings, phantom noises, spellcraft, hellhounds, and the possibility of a glimpse into Satan's realm. It is not a road trip that should be taken lightly. I'd say it, it actually during the night it would probably be a lot different than the day because you don't really have a feel of where you would be at. Um, during the day you can kind of see spot around where you're at and at night it would be more of a paranormal feel actually because uh, you can't determine without probably GPS or something like that where you'd actually be at. So there's lots of graffiti on the bridges um, where we went through uh, the underpasses and things. I could kind of see why the kids would want to come out of here and and possibly dares and, and challenges of, of actually making it through to the seventh gate because it is very mysterious and would probably even be more mysterious at nighttime. So. In addition to the seven gates, Acid Bridge can be found nearby and adds to the unnerving atmosphere of the drive. It's as if the surrounding landscape is caught up in this vortex of the abyss. We're standing along a road between uh, Collinsville, Illinois and Troy, Illinois. And there's several railroad trestles here that were built in the 1800s, late 1800s. And they are known today as the Seven Gates to Hell. Now this journey starts in Collinsville along Lebanon Road, and it wanders through the countryside, winding roads, hills, cornfields, several cemeteries. And it'll go from Lebanon Road to Liberty Road. Then you'll turn off Mill Creek, and from there to Blackjack, and finally you end up at uh, Country Lane and Bower, which is the seventh gate. Uh, now, all seven gates together, they've been witnessed throughout the years to hangings, KKK meetings, satanic rituals, paranormal activity, all kinds of stuff going on all the time. And like I said, all the graffiti gives testament to late night excursions and parties from the legend trippers that go out there. Now, as you go through the first gate, you'll come up on gate number two. That one was a site of the KKK incident where the Klan unfortunately chased down this young African-American boy, captured him, and actually hung him from the railroad trestle there. So at night, uh, right at midnight, sometimes you'll see a residual haunting of the boy hanging from the trestle. After gate two, you'll be approaching gates number three and four. They're linked together. They're called the twin gates because they're really close together. Once again, a lot of graffiti there. Now gates three and four have been the site of several satanic rituals and animal sacrifice. And if you stand around there late at night, sometimes you hear the sound of a car approaching. You'll wait and wait. It'll sound like it goes right by you, you won't see a thing, but it sounds like a car approaching, passing, and going on down the road.
is in the 1970s. Some kids were out one weekend partying, living it up, drinking, dropping acid, high as a kite. As they came up to that sixth gate, they lost control of the car. It hit the concrete of the abutment to the trestle. It actually exploded, caught on fire, killed every one of them. If you approach that gate, wait around there, around midnight or so, sometimes you'll see the uh, paranormal residual haunting of a reenactment of a car hitting the trestle and blowing up, catching on fire, and screams and yells of the dying kids. It's pretty frightening. So as you leave that, it's several miles on down the road. I mean, it seems like it's gonna take forever to get to hell, so to speak, but the seventh gate is the gate to hell. And according to the legend, if you pass through the all seven gates in order and arrive at this gate back here, the seventh gate at exactly midnight, a portal will be opened up. These hellhounds will appear, pounce out, jump at you, and drag you off straight to hell. You're doomed from that point. I think the Midwest stands out in these legends because often our legends are gruesome, gory, and have a cautionary tale of avoidance. Don't go to these places. Whatever you do, stay away. And I think that's different from what a lot of skeptics might claim that these were put into place to lure tourists to the area to make money off of these legends. But in the Midwest, you see it more of an honest appreciation of the folklore behind these legends. Perhaps the most disturbing legend of the Prairie State lies along this nondescript section of back road referred to by locals as Death Curve or Devil's Curve. This is my favorite haunting in all of Illinois, Death Curve. And the reason I love it and despise it so much is that it gave me nightmares for a long time when I was researching it. Because it dates back to 1905, September 30th, when 31-year-old mother, Julia Markham, had had enough. She snapped, went psychotic, went crazy. She told her two oldest and strongest children to go out and fetch water and wood for the day. While they were gone, one by one, she led her five youngest children into the house where she killed them with her own hands with the family wood-cutting ax. When the two older children came back, they were treated to the same behavior. She smashed the skull of her oldest son in with that ax. And once all of her kids were dead, she panicked, grabbed a knife, and gouged at her throat to commit suicide. But the knife must have been too dull. It didn't do the trick. So instead, she gathered up all the bodies of the children, placed them together on a bed, grabbed the coal oil, and poured it all over the bodies and herself, and lit the house on fire. So the father is called home from a nearby farm where he's working and he discovers his wife is gone and all seven children have been brutally murdered. And the story was in many newspapers that he was so distraught that he took a rope, went out into the barn and put the rope around his neck, shot himself, fell off the gallow and then the barn burned down. He committed suicide. And that ran in many newspapers. But the real story was the father survived. He actually moved on with his life and went to remarry later in his adulthood, so devastated by his wife killing all seven of their children. Newspapers said that 
she didn't seem like she was crazed when they people were interviewing her uh, as she lie dying um, that she seemed normal she seemed very relaxed very calm and then later that evening they found a letter she had written in a nearby mailbox and the letter told to her husband that she was sacrificing herself and her children so they could be in the arms of Jesus and in a better place and she hoped that her husband would join her very soon as well which thankfully he did not take that offer of joining her in death so after the father gets back to his house and realizes it burned down his entire family's wiped out due to finances they weren't able to bury all the children separately and there wasn't much left of them anyway to bury so they gathered up the charred bones that they could find and just dumped them all in an unmarked grave and amazingly Mrs. Markham the murderer is buried right next to them in an unmarked grave so they were just simply dumped in a grave and left there because of family finances So people venture out to this cemetery and often see what appear to be children running around in some period type costume from the early 1900s. Often wondering why they're there at such a late hour or why they're not properly dressed. People try to get a closer look only to have these children simply vanish right before their eyes. Over the years, the stories of the ghost children spread and eventually it was connected to the grisly murders and that of Death Curve. So for decades, people have come out to this bend in the road, claiming that when you drive out here, this murdering, axe-wielding woman, her spirit will appear in the middle of the road, crashing you off the road, you'll die, hence the name Death Curve. That they would see her with this blood-dripping axe in the middle of the road, they'd be so startled, they'd lose control of the vehicle, crash, and they'd, that'd be the end of it and that over the decades, dozens of people were said to have died out on this land. And then over the years, the story changed and people started daring one another to walk on the farmland. That if you walked out onto the Markham farmland, you would see their phantom house appear out of nowhere. And if you were brave enough or foolish enough to walk in, you would never return. And of course, I've talked to people who claim they've seen it, but I've never talked to anyone who claimed they went in because obviously they didn't survive to tell me about it. Outside of this murdering spirit of Mrs. Markham, people also see weird balls of light hovering in the area. I talked to a woman who 30 years ago was in high school and she came out here with some friends and they saw this disembodied light moving along the fence line and they were so scared they hightailed it out of here. So a lot of people are so frightened just knowing the background that when they come here they're expecting something to happen and usually it does. One thing that drew me to this case and draws, I think, a lot of legend trippers out here is the whole idea of the ghastliness of it, that death. And I think one of the reasons we're so fascinated with death today is we've been removed from it. 
In the old days, people would get sick at home. They'd die at home. They'd have the wake at home. You'd have the funeral in your parlor, hence the term funeral parlor. So we were close to it back then. We expected it. People died at a younger age. A lot more accidents happened than they do today. So today we're so far removed from death. People die in hospitals. We have the funeral outsourced. We have no connection with death anymore. So when we hear of these legends that are so gruesome and sinister, we have an innate curiosity toward them. And I think that's what draws people out here, that gruesomeness of it. My advice for people who love unique hauntings is to not take my word for it one way or the other. Get out and experience it yourself. Travel to these locations. Make up your own mind. And of course, you have nothing to fear at these places because you don't believe in ghosts, do you?